This is Saurabh and you're listening to my favorite talk show, The Weekly Show with Aditya. The Clash of Champions. The one pay-per-view event where every championship must be defended. And oh boy, were the championships defended gracefully and brutally as well. Let's look at the various championships that were defended and not defended as well. First, it was the intercontinental match between a ladder match between Jeff Hardy, Sami Zayn and AJ Styles. A match that went down to the wire. A match in which one didn't know which of the three opponents would win because you had the use of the ladder which meant that any other weapon or any other outside source which would be generally illegal in a normal pinfall match would be legal in this particular type of match. This match was amusing because one of the competitors, Sami Zayn, had been out of action for a couple of months but he had claimed that he left with the Intercontinental Championship and in his absence it was the match between AJ Styles and Daniel Bryan and later on AJ Styles and Jeff Hardy which took all the attention eventually leading to Jeff Hardy winning the Intercontinental Championship before being an interference by Sami Zayn who claimed that he was the rightful Intercontinental Championship and all the controversies finally led to this particular ladder match and use of all kinds of weapons, the ladders. And then, despite the experience of Jeff Hardy with ladders, which he has been doing for a better part of 25 years, along with AJ Styles, they were bamboozled and outsmarted by Sami Zayn, whom no one took seriously. Using handcuffs as a prop, he handcuffed himself to AJ Styles before he had handcuffed Jeff Hardy to his ear and eventually just when it was thought that neither Sami Zayn nor AJ Styles would be closing towards the championship which was strung high above on the roof, Sami Zayn uncuffed himself, threw AJ Styles down on the mat and went on to win a double intercontinental championship match. There were the two main championships that was the Universal Championship between Roman Reigns and Jey Uso and the ambulance match for the world title between Drew McIntyre and Randy Orton. The stipulation of the ambulance match being that you have to incapacitate your opponent, shove him into the ambulance, close the doors and the referee will ring the bell that you have announced yourself as the world championship. Drew McIntyre did defend his championship but not without interference from retired wrestlers which meant that Christian, Shawn Michaels, Big Show and Ric Flair all interfered at various phases of the match to make sure that Drew McIntyre would emerge as the champion. And why were they interfering? Because it had been a long-standing rivalry between Randy Orton and these wrestlers whom Randy Orton had punished in non-sanctioned matches. And so they took stipulation of a no-disqualification match and interfered at intervals just when one thought that Randy Orton had the match in his grasp. So there was at one point in time which was looking like Randy Orton would go on to win his 14th world title but McIntyre persisted, carried on and he finally claimed Randy Orton into the ambulance. And of course, how can one forget the match for the Universal Championship between a new look Roman Reigns, a new attitude Roman Reigns and his cousin Jay Uso which also went to proportions beyond a match, family affair, 
who will be at the head of the table to provide the livelihood for the family. Such instances were brought right into this match. It was a different Roman reigns in a singles match. Usually in the past in a singles match, Roman reign would always be slightly on the back foot with his opponents taking advantage here. He had a no bar approach, making sure that even if he won through disqualification, that would be acceptable. Since by the time Roman Reigns made his debut, the Rock had already semi-retired. He never got to see a match between Rock and Roman Reigns. This was the closest one could get as far as the match and issues like family feud were concerned except the Intercontinental Championship which had another definition of title changing hands because of all the controversy and all the pre-tournament activities involved most of the championships were defended whether it was the United States Championship between Apollo Crews and Bobby Lashley or it was a three-on-one affair between Apollo Crews and a new faction called the Hurt Business. It will be very interesting to see as to how long this faction lasts because when there are three wrestlers with their own egos, their own ambitions who come together, these factions do not exactly last for long. But this has lasted for the past couple of months. So it's very interesting as to how long this faction can last. Since tag team championship never took place because the wrestlers involved were not cleared to participate to wrestle and then there were the men's tag team championship the raw tag team championship which ended in a strange manner because of injury to one of the opponents and even though one of the wrestlers kicked out the referee gave a call for the bell and then there was the one between nakamura and Cesaro versus the Lucha House Party and we know that when there are more than three wrestlers in a faction and there is an opportunity for a tag team championship, it's often difficult to decide which of two wrestlers will compete for the tag team championships. Nevertheless, the SmackDown tag team championship was also defended. There were of course the two women's championship the raw women's Selena Vega and Asuka and despite efforts by Vega Asuka using all her experience finally tapped out Zelina Vega and then there was the one between Bailey for the Smackdown women's championship it was initially to square off against Nikki Cross but this wrestler Nikki Cross was not cleared so Asuka fought her and an interference from outside meant that Bailey defended her championship. So overall, a very interesting clash of champions pay-per-view. Championships defended in controversial fashions, ruthless aggressions, championships being secured through things never seen before through the use of handcuffs and the wrestlers taking full advantage of the no disqualification stipulation will be back with discussions for the next pay-per-view which will be four weeks from this monday yeah. the wasteland ts elliot part four fell was the phoenician a fortnight dead forgot the cry of girls and the deep the swell and the profit and loss, a current under sea, picked his bones in whispers. As he rose and fell, he passed the stages of his age and youth, entering the whirlpool, genteel or Jew. Oh, you who turn the wheel and look to windward, consider Felvas, who was once handsome and tall as you. After the torchlight red on sweaty faces, after the frosty silence in the gardens, after the agony in stony places, the shouting and the crying, 
prison and palace and reverberation of thunder of spring over distant mountains. He who was living is now dead. We who were living are now dying with a little patience. Here is no water but only rock. Rock and no water and the sandy road. The road winding above among the mountains, which are mountains of rock without water. If there were water, we should stop and drink. Amongst the rock, one cannot stop or think. Sweat is dry and feet are in the sand. If there were only water amongst the rock, that mountain's mouth of carious teeth that cannot spit. But one can neither stand nor lie nor sit. There is not even silence in the mountains, but dry, sterile thunder without rain. There is not even solitude in the mountains, but red, sullen faces sneer and snarl from doors of mud cracked. Houses. Yeah. Homer's Iliad Book 1 But King Agamemnon answered him in haste. True old man, all you say is fit and proper. But this soldier wants to tower over the armies. He wants to rule over all, to lord it over all. Give out orders to every man in sight. Well, there's one I trust who will never yield to him. What if the everlasting gods have made a spearman of him? Have they entitled him to hurl abuse at me? Yes, blazing Achilles broke in quickly. What a worthless, burnt out coward I'd be called. If I would submit to you and all your orders, whatever you blurt out, fling them at others. Don't give me commands. Never again, I trust, will Achilles yield to you. And I tell you this, take it to heart. I warn you, my hands will never do battle for that girl, neither with you, king, nor any man alive. You Achaeans gave her, now you have snatched her back. But all the rest I possess, beside my fast black ship, not one bit of it can you seize against my will. It reads, come try it, so the men can see that instant your black blood gush and spurt around my spear. And the two had fought it out with words. Battling face to face, both sprang to their feet and broke up the muster beside the Argive squadrons. Achilles strode off to his trim ships and shelters, back to his friend Achilles and their comrades. Agamemnon had a vessel hauled down to the sea. He picked out twenty oarsmen to man her locks put aboard the cattle for sacrifice to the god and led Kerises in all her beauty amid ships. Versatile Odysseus took the helm as captain. All embarked. The party launched out on the sea's foaming lanes, while the son of Atreus told his troops to wash, to purify themselves from the filth of plague. Called of through scoring in the surf and sacrifice to Apollo, full-grown bulls and goats along the beaten shore of the fallow barren sea, and savory smoke went swirling up the skies. So the men were engaged throughout the camp, but King Agamemnon would not stop the quarrel. The first threat he hurled against Achilles, he called Talithibius and Eurybates briskly, his two heralds, ready, willing aids, go to Achilles' lodge, take Briases at once, his beauty Briases by the hand, and bring her here. If he will not surrender her, I'll go myself, I'll seize her myself, 
with an army at my back and all the words for him. P.G. Woodhouse, stiff upper lip jeeps. I was conscious of a thrill of thankfulness for Jeeves' prescience. Prescience is the word I want. I mean that uncanny knack he has of peering into the future and forming his plans and schemes well ahead of time. But for his thoughtful diagnosis of the perils that lay before me, I should at this juncture have been deep in the mulag tawny and no hope of striking for the shore. As it was, I was able to be nonchalant, insouciant and debonair. I was like the fellow I once heard Jeeves speak of who was armed so strong and honesty that somebody stretched passed by him as the ideal wind, which he respected not. I think if Spoot had been about three feet shorter and not so wide across the shoulders, I would have laughed a mocking laugh and quite possibly have flicked my cambric handkerchief in his face. He was eyeing me piercingly, little knowing what an ass he was going to feel before yonder sun had Said, I have just searched your room. You have? You surprise me. Looking for something, were you? You know what I am looking for. That amber statuette you said your uncle would be so glad to have. Oh, that I understood it was in the collection room. Who told you that? A usually well informed source. Well, it is no longer in the collection room. Somebody has removed it. Most extraordinary. And when I say somebody, I mean a slimy snake thief of the name of Booster. It isn't in your bedroom. So if it is not in your car, you must have it on you. Turn out your pockets. I humored his request largely influenced by the fact that there was so much of him. Inger Midget would have found me far less obliging. The contents having been placed before him, he snorted in a disappointed way as if he had hoped for better things. Dived into the car, opening drawers and looking under cushions. And Stiffy, coming along at this moment, drank in his vast trouser seat with a curious eye. What goes on? She asked. This time I did laugh that mocking laugh. It seemed to be indicated. You know that black eyesore thing that was on the dinner table? Apparently it's disappeared and Spood has got the extraordinary idea that I have pinched it and I am holding it. What's the word? Not incognito, incommunicado. That's it. He thinks I am holding it incommunicado. He does. So he says, man must be an ass. Spook wheeled around, flush with his excesses. I was pleased to see that while looking under the seat, he had got a bit of oil on his nose. He eyed stiffly, bleakly. Did you... Call me an ass? Certainly I did. I was taught by a long series of governesses always to speak the truth. The idea of accusing Bertie of taking that statuette? It does sound silly, I agreed. Bizarre is perhaps the word. The things in Uncle Watkins' collection room. It is not in the collection room. Who says so? I say so. I say it is. Go and look if you don't believe me. Stop that Bartholomew, you blighted dog, bellowed Stiffy, abruptly changing the subject, and she hastened off on winged feet to confer with the hound who had found something in, I presume, the last stages of decay and was rolling on it. I could follow her train of thought. Scotties at their best are niffy, add to their natural bouquet, 
the aroma of a dead rat or whatever it was and you have a mixture too rich for the human nostril there was a momentary altercation and bartholomew cursing a good deal as was natural was called of tub words yeah. For more awesome content, tune in to the next episode of the weekly show with Aditya.